interested me particularly. It came from a man I'd never heard of. I was worried and I didn't open it, thinking I'd read it later. I didn't get to it until that night, just as my wife was putting the kids to bed. Good night, Bill. Sleep tight, night, boy. Good night, Laura. Be a good girl. Mother, can I sleep with Raggedy Ann? I think so, dear. Well, the letter surprised me. It was from a passenger who'd once flown with me. He wrote telling me he'd enjoyed the experience. Wondered if I'd write him telling him how a big airline operated. I'm not a good correspondent, but anyhow, I decided to answer him. First, I told him I was the right. I'm just one of a team, sir, I wrote. People, each one of them contributing to every flight. I remember your flight, and I'd like to tell you think a big commercial airline worked. Maybe that'll help explain what I mean. Now take my line across the United States, all the way to Bombay, India. First, it's over weather flying. Pioneers, that'll give you an idea. Your flight from Los Angeles, California to New York showed airline teamwork and coordination. You telephoned for your ticket from your home in Los Angeles. Our office received your order, made sure that the flight you wanted was open, and sold you a ticket. Your order went to the message center and immediately was teletyped to our reservations service in Kansas City where my crew would take over for the rest of the trip to New York. Every ticket is cleared here, giving a complete picture at all times. Ten minutes after you'd ordered your ticket, your name was on its correct flight listing. You were all ready. You called for your ticket two days later at our Los Angeles office. Altogether, a pretty painless business. On your departure day, you checked in at the airport. Everything was ready. Your luggage checked aboard. Your traveling comfort in the hands of a smooth working team. That's a fine plane, that constellation you flew in. They built her at Lockheed Aircraft in Burbank, California, using the engineering and production techniques that have made us successful in aviation. A constellation is very costly. And once you've seen her come together at Lockheed, you know why. She winds up over 95 feet long with a wingspan of 123 feet with 10,000 horsepower, more than enough to pull four average railway trains. She weighs 107,000 pounds loaded. When she's finished, we pilots think we've got the slickest ship in the air. Before we ever see her, She's put through a series of exhaustive tests. Every part of her, from nose to tail, gets this treatment. The reason is a word we live by in the airline business. That word is safety. Well, that's the story of your airplane. Now to get back to your flight. You got off on schedule and headed for Kansas City, five hours and 10 minutes away. Pilot and I were old friends. After a couple of hours aloft, you had luncheon. And I think you'll agree with me that the meal compared very favorably with that served by a good restaurant anywhere. Which brings up the food story, one we're pretty proud of. We've done a lot of pioneering here, too. In our Kansas City test kitchen, we're always working on recipes, procedures, and equipment, giving food for thought to food for flying. Although we have six food units around the country from which plane service is delivered, our production kitchen in Kansas City cooks all the meats, potatoes, and desserts for the line. 75% of the food used in our coast-to-coast -coast feeding is prepared here. Five tons of food a week, two and a half million meals a year. These pre-cooked meals are kept in perfect condition in huge refrigerators until they are ready for distribution by air to the line's six outlying food units.
Each unit restores its own food in special ovens. Refrigeration enables us to prepare our food well in advance, yet a meal processed by our system is served as hot and fresh as when it was cooked. Some really neat and efficient containers have been designed for food and drink. Light in weight, that's essential, but sturdy as well as compact. In other words, built for flying. When a plane lands, one of the first things we do is to remove the used service and put in the fresh service, whether it be another meal, a snack, or simply a beverage. Well, sir, with your meal over, you had a chance to look at the scenery. It's pretty spectacular on that Los Angeles to Kansas City run, particularly the Grand Canyon of the Colorado. You know, this letter worries me a little. Are you getting enough behind the scenes stuff? I'll try to put down some inside information. Now, let's see. Did you know it takes the company several years to train a captain or co-pilot? A year or more for other crew members? And that brings up another story, the training story. In Kansas City, we run a regular school for captains, first officers, and flight engineers. We not only teach new personnel how to fly for us, but keep our old employees abreast of new developments that are always popping up in aviation. One of the things that makes our business kind of fascinating. We take three physical examinations a year, two government, one company. And this constant checking up goes for training, too. Once you get started, it never stops. Every six months, we get an instrument check, blind flying. And there are regular line checks. Our pilots have logged a million hours, but these standards are never relaxed. Now for our crew, the crew that picks you up at Kansas City, all fresh and rested, ready for the trip to New York. I'm Captain, 18,000 hours flying with the line been flying since 1933. There's my co-pilot. The flight engineer and our hostesses, two good girls. So much for us. Now, while you were flying toward us from Los Angeles, here's what we were doing in Kansas City. My co-pilot and I checked in at flight control, the operations boys. We talked over New York weather. Ceiling 800 with a chance, but only a chance of lifting. We discussed fuel load and the thousand and one details that go into making ready for takeoff. On the average, we have 57 flights in the air every hour of the day. Operations watches them all. Next, meteorology, weather forecasting. Our company was the first to employ staff meteorologists. And we listen to what they say every time we fly. The chief gave us the weather forecast, which he gets from the government, our own forecasters, and our planes aloft. Weather was uncertain at low altitudes, so we decided on 19,000 feet for a smooth ride over the clouds. My co-pilot got busy with his bookkeeping. Our fuel order amounted to 4,000 gallons, enough to fly from Kansas City to New York and back again. We burn about a gallon a mile, five gallons a minute. I watched your flight come in from Los Angeles. 
It was right on time, too. very busy all at once when a big ship comes in. I've seen it a thousand times, I suppose, but never get tired of watching it. Every man concerned has an important job to do, and it all contributes to the speed, comfort, and safety of your flight. Meanwhile, our flight engineer checked over the airplane. This is standard procedure. First, because he's trained to do the job. Second, because it's good practice to have it done by a man who's going to ride the airplane. These fellows are like doctors. They know where to look. And this checkup takes place every time one of our planes gets ready for departure. had just finished 1,300 flying hours, it would have been brought to this overhaul base and had all four engines replaced. Every 10,000 hours, we just about take the whole ship apart and rebuild her. I wish you and all the other people who fly regularly could see this operation because it typifies the kind of attention a scheduled airline like ours gives its airplanes. First thing we do to a plane when she comes in is to remove her engines and tear them down piece by piece. Each of the thousands of parts is then given an eight hour cleaning in a chemical wash. Next, each part is put through a magnetic analysis to find any hidden faults in the metal. Then hand inspected against rigid tolerances. Some of the parts are okay, good as new. Others may require reconditioning in our shops and still others may be replaced. engine is reassembled, however, every part measures up. It's really like a new engine. After a thorough check by a trained inspector, the newly assembled engine is run for six hours on a test stand. Interiors are entirely renovated in our upholstery shop. They also replace any fabric covered surfaces that need attention. Meanwhile, our sheet metal shop handles any work on the skin and fuel tanks of the ship. The base tests the airplane's radio equipment, every bit of it. It also rips out her entire electrical system and rebuilds it. Her instruments get a ride on an oscillating test machine which goes through the most severe maneuvers an airplane could be subjected to. We repolish and inspect the propellers, too. Every 3,000 hours, we get a new set. The balance of these blades is so perfect that, believe it or not, the weight of a paper matchbox will make them revolve. Continuing maintenance means that a job like this, an operation which takes 4,500 man hours, can be done in six days.
last thing we do is weigh the ship. Our planes must stay within one half of one percent of their original weight. Well, it's nice to know that you've got that kind of a plane under you. Now to continue with your flight. City Ground Control, CWA Flight 2. Request taxi clearance, IFR New York. TWA Flight 2, runway 17, wind south, variable 5 to 10, north on taxi strip. Remember, we taxied past the tower. These boys are the traffic cops of the airport. Working with air route traffic control, they clear my flight plan and keep checking my progress all along the line. We move down to the warm-up block. I suppose you've wondered why there's always a delay before takeoff. Well, here's what's going on up front. Fluxgate compass. Directed. Vacuum. Check two to four inches. Directional gyros. Set and uncage. Trim tabs. Set. Takeoff flap. Takeoff flaps. Speed on heaters. Check ears. Control services. Free and full travel. Engine instruments. Normal. Generators. On. Carburetor air. Cold. Propellers. Full and free. Mixtures. Bridge. Fuel pumps. On high. Airplane. Ready. Kansas City Tower. TWA Flight 2. Ready for takeoff. TWA 2. Clear for takeoff. our altitude and we couldn't see the ground. We didn't have to. Here's how we knew where we were all the way. First we were on the beam, kept getting its signal. Second, automatic direction finder. The airway is marked with radio signposts. As we pass over each one, the needles swing and a marker light flashes on. Flight 2, Columbia 03, 19,000, visual on top, St. Louis 25. And that's the way it went all the way, 1,100 miles. Flight 2, St. Louis 25, Indianapolis 10. Midway between points, we'd tune in on the station ahead and ride in and out of that range. Flight 2, Indianapolis 10, Columbus. 47, 4, 7. Flight 2, Columbus, 46, Pittsburgh, 17, 1, 7. Flight 2, Pittsburgh, 18, Allentown, 11, 1, 1. Flight 2, Allentown, 11, LaGuardia, 35, 3, 5. As we neared our destination, we picked up another navigational aid. This was ILS, Instrument Landing System. It gave us direction and glide. 
while radio markers told us our distance from the airport. Then, by keeping the cross pointers at right angles, ILS brought us straight and true directly toward the field. We fastened our seat belts, got ready to land. are standard procedure nowadays through the magic of radio. That's the story. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to meet you personally, but I expect I shall one of these days. In closing, let me say to you, one of our two million passengers, thanks a lot from me, just one of the 12,000 people who helped run the airline that brought you home safely, comfortably, on time.